right. Let's go. Good morning. Good afternoon. Let me welcome you to this conversation. And it is my delight to be able to talk to Elaine Sixou, whom I consider one of the greatest of living writers, though in her modesty, she doesn't like me to say that. She has a career of great magnitude. I first met her in New York in the late 1970s, when she and her mother came down to a crowded Greenwich Village apartment where my life partner, Elizabeth, was living with her four children. And the children had never forgotten meeting Elaine and her mother, Eve. Lately, Elaine and I had another conversation, sitting on a sofa, another sofa, and I thought, let's have a conversation, and we call them the sofa conversations, as if we were sitting together on a sofa, speaking in a spirit of candor and informality. So here we go. By great delight in having a sofa conversation with Elaine Siksu. The theme of this series is radical imagination, indelible acts. But Elaine, you have interrogated every category of Western thought. Does the concept of the imagination still hold its ancient meaning? Or in the search for truth and the search for meaning, have other of our capacities replaced it, such as the capacity for dreaming? Well, it's such a, a beautiful, huge, and impossible question. Um, I don't know how to situate or how to, to work imagination. I'm not sure, uh, apart from the fact that it deals with images. <laughs> Um, so I, I'll just stay with images, since I think that most, really the, the largest part of my existence has to do with images, whereas I am very short-sighted. <laughs> so the images that I, I have to, to meet and uh, uh, recognize, they, they, they don't come from the front, the front towards me. Uh, they probably come from behind my back, and um, and we already have a, a conversation with with my images. And by the way, you know, I think I see my mother and the children right now, just beside you. I'm glad that you do that. I'm Am I doing that? No, no, I'm here alone. I'm here alone, but. Do you have your cats with you? Well, they're around. Actually, I see them there in reality because they're very close. <clears throat> Maybe they'll, they'll come in. <clears throat> anyway, they have expressed their desire to, to play with us. Well, I hope they show themselves on the screen because they're beautiful cats. <laughs> but one of my favorite of your books is a series of lectures you gave, and it's called The School of Dreams. And you write, Dreams await us in a country we can't get tickets to, but we must travel to them. We must descend into them. What did you mean by that? Um, are, are dreams the source of our realities? I think that what, for me and, and for all dreamers, I, I know that we are all, all breathers, as Shakespeare would say, we are also all dreamers, except that not all dreamers uh, remember or realize they dream, but otherwise it's human to dream. And, and the cats, by the way, of course, so I suppose all other animals, they also dream. Um, now, it's for me, it's uh, half, half of our lifetime is, is on, is happening in the other world or the next world, uh, the, the world, 
the world uh, that exists and uh, and is agitated with by under another light, um, a night light which is very very clear actually. Um, I am for personal reasons, but not but my personal reasons are the same as that of many other poets. I can't I can't be with dreams um, for for all kinds of of, uh, of reasons. One being that um, not only are they the, the greatest poets, they're much more powerful and uh, inventive than I am. You know, for a long time when I was a young writer, I was ashamed because I I knew that my 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 books my so-called books were written by dreams, by my dreams. And uh, I felt like a kind of thief. So all the time I thought, first of all, I shouldn't, um, uh, I shouldn't sign my books mm. uh, or sign it the other, or whatever, you know, or whoever, sign whoever. And uh, signing seemed to me to be a kind of, uh, uh, I was a crook, you know. <laughs> I did, I, I did not confess, and uh, and I felt very very unhappy about that until I realized, all of a sudden, very late, that all writers do that. You know, suddenly I, I saw uh, the dreams um, wandering everywhere in post everywhere. Uh, I realized that our greatest poet Rimbaud uh, just noted down his his dreams it's it's uh, everything he writes is is uh, dictated by dreams and it and and there are so many instances so it relieved me of my guilt <laughs> in, in what often people in america refer to as the quote unquote imposter syndrome <laughs> so, but, 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 it lasted long you know but now it's the contrary. I am a humble um, receptor of what the dreams show, show me, reveal, and uh, I admire them, I thank them, and I'm always expecting them. I'm in love with the, with the dreams. I envy you to have such dreams and to be able to descend into them. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, when I go to bed, it's exactly as in a fairy tale. I'm, I'm joining, I'm, joining, I'm, I'm going and, and joining my, my lover. I don't know who, he, she, them, whatever, uh, is going to visit me. But uh, what I know is that it, they, they're going to be powerful creators and they will tell me the truth that I need to know about myself, mm. and which I'm totally surprised to, to discover. Sometimes I, I, I'm informed by, by the dreams, by this or that dream, that uh, after all, I don't hate the person I think I hate, although this is very seldom, it happens very seldom that I hate. But love, I, I don't know. Suddenly I realized that uh, those I thought I had forgotten are, are there, uh, they're not forgotten, or uh, that an old, an old passion is still burning. Fortunately, it's only during the night. <laughs> and, and I'm informed of what happens on the planet, wars and uh, despair, um, escapes, very often it, it has to do with escaping, of course. But Elaine, you are also known, and you do it so beautifully for putting together your dreams, your fictions, your and your explorations of history. One of your most recent books is called Well Kept Ruins. You know, I had never seen the cover yet. <laughs> Is this, these are the stones left over from the burnt synagogue, are they not? Mm -hmm. uh, and in this book, which you can say far better than I, 
you return to the German village from which your mother had to escape in the 1930s. And you write, to imagine or not to imagine, I imagine my mother can hear me thinking. Otherwise, who would I ask such a question? I say to my daughter, and does she? My daughter says, and does she, your mother answer? And it is a wonderful scene, I think, of dreaming, imagining, bringing together mothers and daughters in this extraordinary book about your return to this city of devastation. It's it's not a village, you know. It's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a very beautiful town and. A, and it's itself is a kind of jewel of memory. It's very strange, you know. It's in Hanover, and um, it was founded by Emperor Charles uh, Charles, Le Quint, Charles Charles the Fifth, who reigned over whole the whole of Europe, and uh, and that was in, in the eighth century. It's a very old city. It's still mm -hmm. there. It, it's you know, with its old houses and uh, churches and towers, um, and it's it's exemplary because may, may I say a few words about the city because it's 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 really please please yes because again if I may say this book well kept ruins is just an extraordinary text and now in English. <laughs> Thank you. And you know, I it, it was my dream city for all, all my life actually, because I was born I was born very far from this city, which is called Osnabrück. Mm -hmm. uh, I was born in Oran. I was born in Algeria, and that was the north of Germany. And my my mind was always south, west of Africa, and. North Germany. And I realized when I was a kid, so that's one of the keys. When I was a kid, I realized that there was an anagram and that Oran, O R A N, was, it was inhabited and was, um, was haunting Osnabrück, O S N A B R E. Mm. So for me, it was. It was one of the keys of the enigma of being alive and, and or, origins. Where do you come from? From Oran in Osnabrück. No. But both, yes? Both. And they, they would exchange and communicate and, uh, and invent also means of co communication te telepathically. But Elaine, you write of the city of Osnabrück, and it's one of the cities you've written about Algiers and other imaginary cities. But you write that it's all cleaned up and rebuilt now. Is this a city that is denied its past? No, it's uh, as, in, as in many, uh, as in most of Germany, you know, there's something that uh, is, uh, that you can meet everywhere. And it's called Erinnerungskultur. It's the mm -hmm. culture of remembering. And it's it's active. That is, the the young Germans, new generations, they actively remember, memorize, uh, feed uh, uh, memory, and and fight against forgetting ev everywhere, everywhere in Germany, which is a political, ethical, and political attitude, which is, I think, very healthy. Uh, particularly as I know, of course, they have to do with the Nazi past, which is there everywhere. Osnabrück was, was a city of peace. Its history was that in 1648, it was one of the two cities, Münster and Osnabrück, the neighbor cities, where the Treaty of Westphalia, wow. which founded Europe, was signed. It was in, in, six, in 1648, if I remember correctly. And it's still there, you know. That is, uh, all the all the 
the princes and uh, ambassadors of all Europe who had been fighting and, and destroying one another for 30 years, it's the 30 years war, they met in Osnabrück and Münster with 50 kilometers between the two cities because on one side were the, the Protestants, on the other side, the, the Catholics. They had stopped the, go the war and you know why? There was no, no more, there were no more people to, to be killed and to kill. So they had to finish the, the war and they joined and invented Europe. Yes. That was where Osnabrück is. It's but this, also, oh, yeah. the city of, where your mother was born, from which your mother was exiled, went into exile. Um, but she did not yeah. consider herself as being an exile. You know why? why? Because she analyzed the, the arrival of Hitler immediately. As a young yeah. woman, as a young girl, she, she understood what he was. Whereas, as you know, there were so many th millions of people who didn't realize they stayed. She went mm -hmm. in and Osnabrück became Nazi in a couple of years, completely Nazi. And the whole um, Jewish community, which was, which I thought when I was a kid, I imagined it was, again, it was very like a huge Jewish city because my mother would, con uh, evoke all the time, all the, the people in the city. So I thought it must be thousands and thousands. In the end, I discovered it was only 450. They were all killed, all those who had stayed. And she had... She never went she back. She to, to escape, to, to leave. Right? She, she didn't escape. She, 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 she left in time. In 1930, yeah. she was out. And her family stayed. So she would come back again yeah. and again and until, until the war and try to persuade her mother to leave Osnabrück, et cetera, et cetera. So all the, the members of the family who, let, who stayed were, were deported and, and murdered. And the others who realized gradually, you know, took a long time to realize uh, they, they were, of right. course. You, you, you write someplace. I was three years old when I realized we were orphans from paradise. Yeah. That's how it sounds in English. Yeah. And it was an experience of antisemitism, was it not? Yeah. yeah. This is a real primal scene. And so if you have two minutes, I, I'll tell yes, you. Yes, please. And then, yeah. I dated to my, when I, I wasn't even three years old. How do I know? Because I was, two and a half in 1939, and it happened in 1939, 1940. Um, my father, who was a, a doctor, at first he, he was um, called into the army as a, uh, as a doctor for the army. He was a lieutenant. In front of my eyes, I was two, suddenly there was somebody, somebody who replaced my father, somebody who came with a soldier's cap and a, a glittering uniform. And I thought, ah, who is that uh, character in the theater? You know, that was my father. A year later, he was expelled from, from the army as a Jew. And, uh, but in, in meanwhile, since he was a lieutenant, we were introduced into paradise, my brother and I. That was a, a beautiful garden, which called, was called the military circle, which, which was uh, reserved for army people only, and particularly officers. So in we, we, we come into paradise with uh, all kinds of plants and uh, uh, neat, uh, well dressed, uh, well kept, and um, but and so I thought we we were admitted. But in when we were inside, I had never been so expelled from any any place. I, I didn't realize I couldn't understand how while we were being admitted, we were on the contrary expelled. And uh, 
so all the other children were having fun, etc. And I kept listening to what they were saying. I thought I don't have the the word, the keyword to to get inside really. You know, so I was. So once I heard them speak about stamps, and I realized that they were trying to, they had a kind of child, childish market exchanging stamps. So now I know what to do. The, the shibboleth was stamps. So mm. I, tell, I tell them, uh, I can bring stamps, you know. We were receiving stamps every day from all the people who had fled Germany. All, all my, my family, my relatives in all kinds of countries, except France, uh, who were sending letters arrive, uh, that arrived in Oran. So stamps, we have plenty. Stamps, I, I, like po postage stamps. We have postage stamps. So, and suddenly a big girl, probably six years old, she spat on me and said, liar. Liar? Mm. <gasps> it was as if I had been wounded by a sword. How? Why? How? All Jews are liars. Oh my God! I didn't even know, you know, that Jews. I vaguely, vaguely heard about that, you know, but we weren't practicing. We, I, I had never heard about that. All Jews are liars. First law. And and now, I realized why we we weren't admitted, and I didn't know what to do with this. Terrible judgment. It was uh, the first trial. And uh, so I went back to my place. And then I met with philosophy. That is, I, I thought it's a dilemma. If I bring stamps, I, I crawl in front of those terrible enemies, you know, who, who, who fled hatred. If I don't bring stamps, all Jews are liars. And I, re I remained with that. And what did you do? I dreamt. I dreamt that I met a little girl who was exactly my size, but she was all fair haired. I was dark. And I thought, now I'm going to kill you. And, and then I didn't know how to kill her because I was three and how do you kill? So I remembered vaguely something about Snow, uh, um, Snow White and, and the apple. I thought, this is the way to kill. I had no, no apple. So I went to the garden and I had a pear. And uh, <clears throat> so I ate most of the pear. I gave her the, the kernel, the, the, the last piece of the the pet to, to, to this little girl who was me, mirror-like. I gave her the pear and the, the, the bit of pear and I told her, you have to eat that. And the little girl, innocent, she, she eats the, 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 the rest of the pear. And I wanted her to die. You know, first murder. It's exactly as in the Bible. But Elaine, it's your work shows so deeply the struggle between the desire to love and hatred. This is you describe now the hatred of a child who has been treated cruelly. You know, Algeria was completely uh, obsessed by hatreds, different hatreds and racisms. It, there were racisms everywhere of all kinds. And I, I, I was initiated when I was three, very, very strongly. There was hatred between the different parts of the population. The French were monsters of colonization. The so-called Arabs were slaves. It was horrible. It was an, an apartheid. Going into the streets for me was a, a torture you know I, I i was beside myself with with anguish and, uh, and and despair at seeing how human people were torturing and uh, and uh, humiliating human beings 
then there were anti-Semitisms everywhere, from the French to Jews, mm -hmm. from the, the between uh, Arabs and uh, it was it was hard. It was hell. It was hell, and and we were thrown out as mm -hmm. as Jews. One year later, there was a decree from the French state, which collaborated mm -hmm. with uh, Hitler, throwing the Jews out of the French national later. So not only were we out of the garden, we were out of the nation, out of everything. But yet, in your work, there is the call for love. Can we move to your essay, your formidably influential essay, that was published in America in 1976, but in France in 1975, and in English called The Laugh of the Medusa, because it is this call for love through writing. And I know that our audience knows who Medusa is, but just a reminder. So would you mind just going back to this essay because of what I see is so important in your work is this almost Gnostic struggle between the hatred of our species and our capacity for love. So would you mind if we just looked at that essay for a moment? Could we, and what we have, now just to remind people who Medusa was, or Medusa. Uh, Elaine, help me with this. This is a Greek vase, it's 2,600 years old. And this is Medusa, right? Your Medusa, with her so, hair out of stake, she was a Gorgon. Here and is Perseus, right? Mm -hmm. Perseus is a heroic figure. And here is the goddess Athena, whom Perseus is seeking to please. Now, what and can that be? Pardon. There's Athena. Yeah. But here is your Medusa. Your Medusa, so influential with her hair of snakes, feared. But you, in this essay, The Laugh of the Medusa, transform how we're to think of Medusa on the side of love. At least this is one way in which I read through writing. Would you mind just looking in English, in, in English at the first paragraph of this essay? In fact, could I even tempt you into reading in English the first, the first paragraph? I'll try to. I shall speak about women's writing, about what it will do. Woman must write herself, must write about women and bring women to writing, from which they have been driven away as violently as from their bodies. For the same reasons, by the same law, with the same fatal goal, Woman must put herself into the text, as into the world and into history by her own movement. And then the last paragraph, would you mind, could I tempt you, please, to reading the last paragraph? When I write, it's everything that we don't know we can be that is written out of me. It's written out of me, without exclusions, without stipulation. And everything will be calls us to the unflagging, intoxicating, unappeasable search for love. In one another, we will never be lacking. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you. For, and I'm sorry we don't have time to do that. I want to go in so many directions now. Um, if we could, I maybe briefly talk about how you rethought this essay in 2010, but not, Brad, we rethought it a little bit. But I would also like to talk, and perhaps this would be of greater interest to you now, which is where do we hear the language of women now erupting? You gave an interview in 2016 when you were working on your play about India, and you gave it in an interview in India where you said, we can hear the voices of women, the voice of a Medusa who will not be killed. 
we can hear in many times and places. And where do we hear her now? Do we hear her in Iran? I know you've been writing about Iran. I saw a mention to you getting a telephone call from Iran in 1979. But where? As you listen to Iranian women today, do you hear this kind of voice, this unappeasable desire for love, for freedom? I think um, that in in a repeated way, unfortunately, the the one of the the main issues of um, the the love of Medusa, which is the murder, the assassination of women by men, typical, arch typical, because of course not all women are assassinated almost, uh, I might say, a large number, a large number of women, uh, uh, either really or symbolically. Uh, but not all men are murderers, fortunately. Um, but still, the scene of the Medusa, that is the fact that a man uh, decides to brag, to brag of his virility, because this is what triggers Perseus, you know, when he, he decides to, to go and kill Medusa and bring her head back yes. to a, a circle of kings and princes, it's, he brags, you know, he, he's the, 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 the example, the horrible ex example of felicity. So, uh, he, you want a gift? I'll, I'll bring you the, the Medusa. It's enormous, you know. It's exactly the, 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 the first instance of what will be a repeated murder throughout centuries, millenaries, and goes on today, and will, it will go on, it will go on until the end of history. So first, uh, the, the, the horror of the situation is, has not disappeared. Now it is described. Nowadays, the, the new, the new uh, step in the development of this uh, horrible tragedy is the fact that so many women are aware. You know, when we met, uh, and uh, it was the beginning of the, the, the first, first centuries, if I can say so, of women's lib. Um, and uh, I, I enjoyed being in the States because it was ahead of what was happening in France. And, but feminists were a, a small minority. Mm -hmm. the, the, the fight for uh, women's rights was something exceptional. Now, of course, it's wider uh, in, on, on the face of the earth. But the, 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 the scenario is always the same. It's a, a woman who is well known for her power, uh, whether it's imaginary or real, uh, is going to be killed and uh, she will be beheaded, she will be decapitated because there, you know, there's the siege of, of thinking, of, of wisdom. And one thing I didn't say in my essay, <clears throat> because it was already, I had so many things to say already, <clears throat> is the fact that, uh, which is, uh, I think, remarkable, that Medusa was pregnant. When, when she was murdered. She was pregnant. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's, of course, an additional <laughs> feature. And, uh, and the other thing is that when he, she was decapitated, the, her, her blood um, went up in, in the sky and out of it, and, and, and she gave birth. She gave birth through her decapitation, and she gave birth to a wonderful creature, Pegasus. I don't know how you pronounce it. Do I pronounce Pegasus, it? Pegasus, yes, yes, the winged horse. Uh, 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 wonderful uh, flying horse, you know, who haunts my dreams very often. I very often see wind, winged horses. <laughs> so, so you know uh, the the. The Greek mythology is is the, the, the Bible of politics and uh, 
uh, and uh, it's it's prophetic all the time. It's extraordinary. He said it's not analyzed. It's given like that. You know. So this scene is repeated all the time. Decapitation of women. You know. You know that if they are beautiful, they have to be to be raped and and killed. If they're clever, they have to be decapitated and killed. Always. Now, the the scene changes slightly. The scenario has variations. And uh, now, for instance, uh, what happens in Iran? And I'm happy that you mentioned the fact, because I myself have been thinking about that. Actually, tomorrow and and the day after tomorrow, I'm going to to be filmed for the, the Deutsche Welle, which is a um, um, German media, European. Um, uh, regarding Iranian women, it happens that in the beginning of women's lib in, in our century of feminism, uh, among the women who were suddenly threatened uh, were the, the Iranian women. That was at the end of the 70s. And uh, there were huge um, demonstrations in I remember going to the first big demonstration in Paris with my mother who was a midwife <laughs> so she went she came she always uh, went along to the demonstrations with her little uh, medical bag in, in case there were wounded people to take care of immediately and uh, and at that time I was rather committed to I mean, the, 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 the most uh, urgent uh, actions had to do with women's rights. But for me, it was transformed also by poetry. So I would poeticize uh, not, not, uh, not on purpose. It just happened like that, everything that was happening. And I remember that uh, while writing, I had such a, a, a joy in writing that is in going further in knowing more in being taught by writing not by myself being taught by what language helps you to to discover uh, about what is hidden be behind for instance the story of the medusa etc and then i uh, i thought that there's the, a demonstration in the street should i remain writing with my notebook or should i go and demonstrate a, a question i've always had and uh, so I thought, the, the Iranian, the Iranian women will have to join, <laughs> you know, go to the demonstrations, leave my my writing, go in the street, and uh, something which is also a metaphor of uh, the choice women have to do all the time, whether they'll be active, how to be active, what is action. Uh, is writing a kind of, can it be uh, a political, a moral action? It's, it's, it's very complicated. You can't give a simple answer. But that was in, in 1978 or nine. And, and while now I am committed as, uh, as, as much as I can be, which is not much with Iranian women, uh, I was also torn by a dilemma. I was completely, uh, I had given all my forces to Ukraine and uh, to the situation in Ukraine. In Ukraine I, it, 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 it has given me all terrible emotions. And suddenly I thought, no, Ukraine and uh, Iran. So where do I live now? Where, where do I dream? A mixture of both, whereas a little time before it was Afghanistan, and um, and then I was required by Iran, also by family <laughs> urgencies, because my my grandson, who is a historian, um, his his partner is Iranian. She's a lovely Iranian girl, and they called me and said, "You must do something for the Iranian women." <laughs> Of course, yeah. 
here with my my uh, my cats and my writing, <laughs> I felt completely, you know, <laughs> without the, the power I should, we should have. But of course, the Iranian women now, first of all, they have been struggling for fifty years, all the time, all the time, all the time, <laughs> either uh, clandestine or. Oh, in, in the open, but they can't be in the open. They killed when they come out in the open and and show their hair. That is, show their head. So show their like the, like the snakes on Medusa's hair. Head. It's the same. Then... But now there's a change, a small change. The small change is that the the young girls who demonstrate in Iran. They are so courageous that those who are outside Iran can't believe it, you know. They're so courageous. They know they can be killed. They go. Elaine, recently, for the last few days, the Iranian authorities have executed two young male protesters. You, in the past, wrote about bisexuality, not as a sexual action, but as a psychological action. What do you see in the execution of the sons as well? In the execution of the sons, are they trying to extirpate different energies in young men? Well, it's it's a very good question. It's a very important scene, of course. Uh, it it of course has to to be considered that they 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 want the 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 the, the pulsion of destruction is so strong that it it even reaches the sons even the sons should be executed if they side with women mm. as if they were unmanned yes yes i see what you're saying you know we have to go to our questions our time is almost up and i am in anguish about that because well, we were going we we're going to talk about queerness. We were going to talk about animals and your cats. We were going to talk about your extraordinary work in the theater and your sense of what the theater can do. You wrote about the theater that it tells the stories, quote, legendarily and yet straight in the eye. And could people, as I ask you one more question, which we did not plan for. Well, people put your questions into the chat or into the Q&A, and then they will come into the chat. I'm just going to see the other, we did not talk about your extra, writing about animals and what that means in terms of the destruction of the binary. We didn't talk about aging. Before we go to the questions from the people who've been listening to you, would you forgive me if I asked you an audacious question? <laughs> Would you come back? Would you do another sofa conversation with me? <laughs> you, you don't have to answer now. I will put it in writing. But I would be thrilled if you would, before you take the questions here, think about coming back and having another sofa conversation with me later in the winter so okay. we could talk about... Just think about it. We could talk about all the things we couldn't talk about today. And we could hear more of your extraordinary wisdom and ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Here, let me see. What is the first question for you? Uh, Jay, where is the question? They're in the Q&A now? Jay, are the questions in the chat or in the Q and A? Uh, where where are they? The questions. Ah, I have to see. Probably here. But get. Oh, I have time then to ask you one more question. What next for you? One of your consistent metaphors. You describe yourself as a traveler as traveling, especially as flying. And 
one of your memorable stories called Shared at Dawn. It's about who you and your cat find a bird that has been trapped in the lattice of your balcony. But here you are, this traveler, flyer, and the bird. Turns out to be alive after all. Um, so what next, my traveling friend? And here is a question, wonderful question. So just think about it. my traveling friend, my flying friend. Here is a question. Uh, what do you think of contemporary queer and feminist theory? And what about contemporary feminist politics, especially around trans exclusion? Exactly the same as I, as I thought uh, fifty years ago. <laughs> I haven't yeah. changed. You know, of course I am, uh, and I think that uh, it's if uh, reading uh, the love of Medusa uh, with this question in head, one would see that uh, uh, I would approve anything that uh, is uh, uh, an emanation of a. Uh, the need for freedom, for invention, for trying, um, uh, inventing all kinds of, of ways of uh, exploring life. You know, it's it's so. Now, uh, I I think that I, I should say something, which, from from my point of view, precisely that of a, of a writing person, a writing being, I'm a writing being. Um, you know, uh, tra trans, transgender, etc. All this has uh, existed um, in, in the, the country of writing for centuries. <clears throat> uh, it existed in Ovid, oh, ev everything, everybody is constantly changing, ex exchanging forms, sexes, etc. Um, even in mythology, as you know, uh, Tiresias, is that the way you pronounce Tiresias? Tiresias, yes. The prophet of mm -hmm. uh, Greek, who was nine years uh, a man, nine years a woman, and, and, and then going on and being a, a, a womb man, etc., etc. Well, all these, all these possibilities, not impossibilities, possibilities, have always existed, and of course, the, the the main recorder of those experiences is Shakespeare. If you read mm. it as you like it, it's incredible, you know, uh, where you you trans you trans all the time, all the time. And now, what are <clears throat> what are the the modalities or with with what kind of tools or um, help uh, can these transposition and and progress uh, happen? It's language. You know, it all with the help of language. Language can uh, uh, inspire and and uh, and help all situations. And of course, you if you dream, then everything happens in dreams. You know, as you know, <laughs> we are others all the time. So, uh, for me, what is formulated now is uh, is. Uh, um, a moment in the in the beautiful and and terrible and unfinished history of what will happen with the, the powers of of uh, human species, and of course I, I don't separate that from the animal species, which is so um, almost human and and uh, and and vice versa. One other last question. What do you urge us in the theater community to do in this moment? How best do we wield our power? How about the pun? How best do we wield our power in the theater community? Of course, they're theater communities, but um, how, how best to write today in the theater? Uh, regarding the theater, 
as as an art in general or it, anyway. the question just says theater community so because take, it course, as you, take it as you will community is is a word that is difficult for me to to uh, uh, to really appreciate uh, because because I I theater if I can say so I theater in France. France is a great theater country, but it's very diverse. There are all kinds of experiences and experiments in regarding theater, uh, and I belong completely to a particular company, which is the Théâtre du Soleil. It's a real company. Now, a real company means it's it's a crew of eighty people who are equals. It's very re revolutionary and and uh, demanding or not all theaters have this the same time of pattern they're very different some are uh, non-inventive some are experimental there are all kinds of possibilities now so my point of view is that of my company of le théâtre du soleil with ariane mushkin who is a genius in in theater and by the way she's a woman of course, we never say that because in the theater, it doesn't mean anything. The, the experience that you have 40 actors or how, I don't know how to, 40 players. So no actors or actresses, etc. <clears throat> and they, they embody everything. A, a young boy can be an old woman. Uh, uh, this young actor, young player can embody as in one of my plays, night, night, night. You know, when I, I wrote a part for night, so everybody says, but who is night? How is night? Then a young player came forward and say, I'm night. And everybody recognized night. You know, that's what ha happens with the theater. So there's total freedom and it's not theorized. There's no theory, there's no, um, uh, trying to to translate the experience because it's 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 um, it's childlike and uh, genius like you can do everything or when I said to Ariane uh, I'm I don't know what to do because I need a bear on on the stage never mind you'll have it in comes the bear <laughs> everything everybody is possible and you are possible in every way that's you my... also yeah. sorry finish please finish yeah. no it's just that of course it, it's uh, the ideal theater is that it's that of shakespeare when the the wall is a player the a player is a wall etc why not hmm? i am so sorry that our sofa conversation and thank i want to thank people who send in the questions but uh, I'm so sorry that this sofa conversation has to come to an end, but I want to leave with something else you said about the theater, where you said, these are also our stories about the gods. And then you write, the theater tells the stories about, quote, the English, the hell we have in being human. And you go on, human, I mean to say, this is Elaine, I mean to say, we are the scene of the war between good and evil. That there is war means there is a chance for good, a chance to distinguish oneself and to vanquish. And I want to thank you for being a force for good. Kate, I want to thank you. <laughs> it's okay. And may I say to you, and say to our audience, season's greetings. It's a season in many different places, in many different places. Season's greetings. And if there is to be a new year, may it really bring in the new, in this, war between good and evil and you do think in these great deep ways your dreams may be very particular but in your writing you do sense the spaciousness 
of human and of animal life. You think cosmically, if I may say so. And again, I want to thank you for it. And thank you, too, for showing us the chance of being good. And for being, and please, don't try to stop me from what I'm about to say. Thank you for being a great writer. Kate, uh, you know, uh, well, I'm glad I can't believe you, really. <laughs> I'm very thankful. And, and I think you're extraordinary. After so many lives and so many children, and, uh, and we have to talk about children. We have to talk about children and grandchildren. And, and great-grandchildren. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and may their lives continue. <laughs> and they, thank you again so much. Forgive the French. Merci bien. Merci bien. And to our audience, thank you for being here. We will be back in the spring. I truly hope I can inveigle L.A. to return. And until then, may your day be well. May your day go well for me, for everybody. Elaine, thank you again. Thank you, thank you. And the peace and, and love for Iranian women and all women that they fight for. Yes, absolutely. That continue to act on the laugh of the Medusa with its joy its courage, its bravery, its entrance into language. May we have that. Bye, Elaine. <laughs> Hello to Paris.